is Douglas Wang. Well, even though that you see that she chat before it, nobody actually called me that except for my parents. So Doug is fine. Douglas is great. Uh, Mr. Wang is not necessary. I also teach here in the college. I teach in the ET department. I teach on electronics. However, before I was a teacher, before I was into electronics, I was actually like you guys. I was a gamer. So a lot of things I learned, or a lot of things that inspired me to learn, we actually came from gaming. So you see, when you play those kind of first-person shooter Air Force games, right? That's the reason I go on and learn about physics, learn about G-force, all that crazy stuff, right? Or, or for example, when you play Empire, right? The storytelling game that's driving me to read about a lot of history. So gaming is actually a good motivator for learning. And today I want to talk to you about how can we use gaming in a broader context? And applying some of the psychology terms that we have been researched about, we combine everything together to give you a perspective on, maybe it will give you a brand new reason of why you are doing gaming, or a brand new application of what your skill in gaming can do, okay? So, the first things before everything else, I want to bring this sentence, okay? This is a sentence by Bottle. He is a philosopher. And what he said was, we do not want to train our children to learning by force or harshness, right? Not really telling you that you couldn't do it or anything else. But we really want to direct them to do it by using what amused them. And I think amusing is a great part. Because why do people game? Why do you guys play games? For the fun. Right? Because it's fun, right? Because it amuses you, it stimulates your mind. Now, if we can use this kind of stimulation in the right way, we can also help people learn. We can do a lot of amazing things with it, right? So without um, sort of set aside what's the serious education and what is a not so serious gaming education, what we need to think is what can we best do as an educator or as somebody who is in the place where we can design for things, right? To design something that people will be interested in working on, given that it's gaming, given that it's education, given that it's other contexts. So, to do that, I want to talk to you about a concept called grounded cognition, okay? So when you say something is grounded, it means that it's rooted in something, right? So in grounded cognition, what's the most important thing is to provide people with the environment. So when you have an environment, for example, uh, this is the learning environment, right? So when you submerge into this environment, you automatically feel that you want to learn something or you're obligated to learn something. This is environment, grounded cognition provides that we provide an environment so that our body Right, can connect our environment stimulus into our modal sense, so either through looking, through hearing, through touching, we'll have a central processing uh, that built into a model, which we a lot of times is called a mental model. So a mental model sounds maybe a little bit abstract, but it really is just a model you build in your mind. So everybody built a model before, right? So when you build a model, for example, then you can use that model to forecast what possibly outcome will be, even though without having observed it, right? So if you build a model airplane, right, then you can use it to simulate all the different kinds of maneuver that you haven't observed an airplane did before, but you can use that to si stimulate, right? So we use mental model to simulate, and we use mental model to simulate a lot of outcomes that we haven't observed. So in classroom, there's no way that you can learn everything about everything, right? We can teach you some concepts, but then, we use that concept to help you build a mental model so that in the future, when you run into similar problem, you can build that up on the mental model and learn it on your own, right? So for example, you guys are learning Maya, right? right. You learn a lot of very fundamental and somehow advanced coding or uh, controlling skill, right? But Maya is a very comprehensive software, right? And it's just with this fundamental introduction, you will build a mental model about Maya that help you to future application or in some way enhance your learning into the next level, right? So mental model is important. It's grounded from grounded cognition, which is the environment that help you learn, right? Now, where did haptic technology come into place on this one? Have ever, everybody heard haptic before? No. No? OK, so let me give an idea from a broader perspective. So in order to form a grounded cognition, right? So we say grounded cognition is the environment, right? This is your classroom, it's the sense you smell, it's the feeling you touch with the keyboard, it's the mouth and everything, right? So in a grounded cognition, there are many, many ways to stimulate your sensory <coughs> input. So this stimulates through something what we call a multimodal representation. 
So unimodal means one model, right? Multimodal means multi-model, right? So I'll give you a very basic example. And this is an example that you have been doing it throughout your whole life without knowing it. In classroom, right, you, you look at what we demonstrate on the board. You listen to our voice. So you'll be seeing and you'll be hearing, right? That's already two modal. Okay, this dual model input is a lot of times contribute to what you learn. Because, like for example, when you go out to Apple Farm, right? You want to pick Apple. If you just, if they only allowed you to go in with two hands, then the most you can pick is two Apple. Maybe, you know, carry some with your arms, but that's all you can do, right? What if I give you another basket that you can carry more? What if you, I give you another basket that you can carry more, right? So with Unimodal, with just seeing, there is only a certain part of our brain that's used in processing information. Now, adding that to hearing, there's more things that we can take in. And adding the sense of touch, right? Then we can be able to carry more information so that we have a huge capacity of processing those information. It helps us learn. It helps us to understand, submerge into the situation, right? So. You, multimodal representation is the process of con constructing a conceptual understanding through the sense of hearing, seeing, and touching, right? And in a traditional classroom, we, we do that a lot, like I just said. So you, you even do that when you were a kid. How do you learn about a bird? Like when you say a bird, right? You have a concept of a bird. But that concept of a bird came from seeing, actually seeing a bird, right? You have saw a bird before. You have heard a bird chirp, right? And then you know that sound. So when something is sounding like a bird, you know that's a bird. When something looks like a bird, you know that's a bird, right? Now, in the formal education, we haven't really touched on haptic channel. And the reason is very simple, because it's very hard to simulate, right? If I, uh, and, and somewhat, um, in the past, hard to simulate, if I may say. If I want to introduce you to temperature, right? It's better for me just to show you, instead of having you put your hand over on fire. Right? We we're getting a lawsuit for that. But now with advancing technology, we can actually do that. Right? And one of the things that we can do is use haptic technology. Haptic is a sense of touch. Right? So when you, for example, learn about the difference between a fine grind sand and pebble stone, it's that because they feel different, right? So if you are a handyman and you go out and buy sandpaper. There are different kinds of sandpaper, different grades, right? And you can feel them by feeling the different texture. That's the sense of touch. And that's what haptic technology is aiming to demonstrate. Sense of touch, sense of force that help you to feel something. Okay, and a lot of times, it's very useful in the classroom. Because, you know, let's face it, not many students, not every student can learn the material from just reading the content, right? You read the textbook, okay, it seems to be telling you something, but you are, so, you, you are never so sure, right? Some people can do it very well. Some people can look at the equation, look at the chart, and tell you exactly what the chart is trying to tell you. And some people just never really catch the point, right? That's because people learn things differently. I, for one, learn things differently. When I was an engineering student, the best experience I have on learning something is actually doing it in a project. So I, I was learning semiconductors, right? I have absolutely no idea what the concept is trying to say. Until I actually get my hands on a simulator and teach myself how each response would produce a different outcome, all right? So a lot of people learn things differently. However, our traditional education system doesn't really allow us to do that. You go to public school, they don't really have the resource or the ability to do a lot of hands-on activity or design a lot of hands-on activity material for students to try. So we just have two models, right? Two models, in some ways, hearing and seeing. But we try to change that. As a gamer, you try to create an environment, help people. As an educator, I try to create an environment to help people too. The only difference in some way is that I'm trying to <coughs> incorporate some content knowledge into it. And maybe this is something that, that will inspire you to do any, in, in the future as well, as well right? So um, now. Continue on haptic technology. Traditionally, haptic technology has been using, uh, accomplished by the sense of vibration. 
right? So this, you probably have the experience before. And still, to this day, a lot of technology use this part, right? So very simple, we control. When you swing on we control, it vibrates, right? Yeah. Or the modern day uh, cell phone, especially those Android ones, a lot, of that, a lot of time have a feedback screen that when you touch the screen, you'll feel a buzz, right? So those are the vibration feedback. However, this is very limited because it doesn't contain any information. Okay, you touch something, you hit something, it vibrates. Big deal, right? I know I hit something. Well, I can know by looking at it as well. So what does it actually tell us? It's very limited, you see. So the drawback to it is that it doesn't have any meaning. So to give any meaning, the advancement uh, help us to incorporate force, okay? Because force, direction force, right? The magnitude of force gave us certain information. So that we have this. And as a gamer, you guys probably have play around with it before. I mean, I don't think it's in market anymore, but the sign wider used to be a big deal, right? Because by turning the joystick, you can actually feel uh, there is a force against you, right? So when you play fly game, fly simulators, right? This is the most <coughs> amazing part, is that you can actually feel when you're trying to fly up, fly and fly down, left and right, right? However, this information is very limited, you see. With a two dimension, you know, from back, left, and right, right? Two dimension. There's only certain information it carries. And there's a limitation in its application. So for example, you, if you're trying to use this to teach someone, someone something, right? Like for example, in any topic of physics, you can only teach it in a 2D context. And it pretty much limited to you to a certain topic. Like for example, cranking a gear, right? It doesn't do anything else. So there's a limitation. And this limitation was actually limited by the hardware that people have developed and designed. So with more development, now we have something what we call a directional force feedback. So directional force feedback means that you can pinpoint a direction to your force feedback in a 3D environment so that you will be able to clearly define where the force came from, how big is it, and how it feels like when you are trying to simulate a certain object. This is what we have. This is called a Novan Falcon. So I have this in my hand, a Novan Falcon. And actually, I'm going to pass it around. It's quite heavy. And uh, so please don't drop it. But uh, as you can see, this is actually an alien looking joystick. But it's, after all, a joystick, right? It has three control arms, OK? And with this three control arm, it defines this ball pointer to a three dimensional space. And with these three control arms, you can produce force in any direction you want. Okay, so I'm gonna pass it along. It's not connected, so it doesn't have any force effect so far. But you can play around with it to see how you uh, how you feel about it. All right? Yeah. And your name is Michael. Yeah. So hi, Mike. I'm Douglas. So what's the question you have? Um, it was regarding the Novan Falcon. So right. Just to um, recorrect it again, it's supposed to be like a simulation for force. It simulates force. But it do much more than that, you see. In the past, when we simulate force, it's limited in a two-dimension, two right? But you know and we know we don't live in a two-dimensional world, right? So three-dimension is the natural way we interact with things, right? So now with this technology, we were able to bring three-dimensional touch and sense of feeling into a simulation, right? And, and it's not saying that we replace everything that we learn by touching, right? I mean, you still pick apple with your hands. This is not going to really help you to do that. But if anything, if there is any situation where it's not ideal or it's not possible for you to actually feel it, then we can use this to simulate in a safe condition. And actually, this piece of equipment wasn't initially designed to be educational. It was actually a gaming equipment. So um, this equipment was first introduced when people are still very, very heavily involved with Counter-Strike. Right? And in Counter-Strike, people play Counter-Strike before, right? Yeah. So, so you, you, everybody, yeah, me too. So when you use mouse, right? You, it's a lot of times um, people don't feel that natural because you are moving in the sort of XZ space when actually you are actually, I mean, sorry, in the XZ space when you're actually shooting in the XY plane, right? 
So people don't feel natural. And that's why they create this piece of equipment. And this equipment actually... Um, I have a question. Sure. How do you hold it? What's you you hold it. Okay, sorry. I should have shown you guys. So normally, you, you, you put it on the table like this, right? And you'll be sitting down, you'll be facing the monitor, and you put this part. You, you, you move this part. The ball part has four different bottoms, right? So in some ways, you can think about it as a force feedback mouth, but only that it does much more than just a mouth, right? So you hold like this, and you can move about, okay? And this one actually, uh, their first introduction came with the gun handle uh, kind of joystick. Unfortunately, we couldn't really have it in New York, but for the rest of the United States, we could have it. Um, again, it's an it's a equipment that was initially designed for gaming. So if you, for example, if you play, play like Warhammer, right, anything like that, this joystick actually have a control um, add-on so that when you have this joystick, you can use this joystick instead of your mouse to play those games. And it gives you different kinds of feelings. Right? Even as something explodes next to you, you'll feel that vibration through your joystick. Or if you actually shoot a shotgun, and, and in opposed to uh, shooting a handgun, it gives you a different kick, different recoil. I mean, we probably shouldn't talk about this in the classroom given the recent events, but you know, that was initially what it was designed for. And, oh, sure. What other types of genres are it? Is it um, could it be terribly poor? Like, uh, what other types of games could you play with? That? Yes, a lot of, actually quite a lot of other kind of games. So mostly it starts off with simulator, right? So with simulators such as um, first person shooter mm -hmm. or fly games or racing game, you use this to help you to gain a better control or to have a different kind of feeling when you play. But now people have used it because of the nature. People feel a lot of natural when you actually do things in this dimension, right? Instead of using mouth. So quite a lot of people applied it into different other genres, such as role playing, right. right? Because in role playing, you actually have a map, and a lot of times when you play role playing games, you want to have the quick ability to go precisely to where you want to go and do yeah. what you actually need to do, right? For example, StarCraft Two, right? In order to be very good at StarCraft Two, people have to do something called micro control, mm -hmm. right? And to do micro control, a lot of times people feel that the mouse doesn't really help you to do the job, so they will use this to do it. You also feel avatar forces as you move. When you bump straight into something, you feel a rear force. When you fall and land, you feel an upwards force. Here you can see the force on the Falcon from walking straight into something. And here is the force from falling and landing. You can feel the effects of a mech stomping on the ground near you. You'll feel the ground lightly tremble beneath you as the heavy feet impact the earth. You can feel variations in the forces too. In Talent Special Ops, for example, you can slow time with your powers. You'll feel regular recoil effects when time is normal, but as time is slow, the feeling of the recoil changes and is more pronounced, giving you a deeper sense of immersion into the game. Driving vehicles is another exciting area of gameplay with the Falcon. When you first get in a vehicle, you can feel the engine idle. When a vehicle accelerates, you can feel it. You'll feel acceleration starting, stopping, and going around corners. Here you can see the Falcon push back against your hand while accelerating, similar to how you would push back against your seat in a real life car. You can drive over terrains, feeling all of the bumps in the road, or smash into objects. Here you can see terrain forces, and then a more abrupt sudden force when you smash into something. If you can incorporate something by using a 3D uh, inversive tool, which would be the thing that you're uh -huh. holding on to right now, uh, how would you be able to incorporate it to, to something else other than like education purposes? Like, uh, let's say like web design. This is mostly used as a user interactive device, which means that in, if you are designing a website that you know somebody who will be using this to, to interact with, right? Mm -hmm. Then you know that they have a capability to experience the 3D space. So then your website design can instead of be a very flat mm -hmm. web-based 2D interface, it could be a 3D. So you can design your website in some ways like a room, right? You get some information in this corner, some interaction in that corner, and all by doing, using this to explore your website. So that will be a new experience for users. Now, of course, that also given the context that your user have those equipment, yeah. right? Yeah. So as a designer also, I think this is most important um, for people who actually have to work with the three-dimensional space. So when you're trying to create a three-dimensional space, 
right? Traditionally, you use mouth. So which means that you need to um, basically design each plank at each time so that you will have a three-dimensional space. Now, if we can find ways to incorporate this into designing, then we will be able to sort of try to create a three-dimensional space altogether, a 3D object altogether, instead of doing the you know, X, Y, Z axis, right? So that might help people to speed their designing, or that might help people who initially have absolutely no idea or hard to grasp the idea of three dimension to finally get the design of three dimension out there in the computer simulation. So this is one, another way we can incorporate it. So this 3D space that you feel, the workspace is two, inch, uh, two by two by two, right? And then the force capability is larger than two pounds. So that's quite a lot. I mean, it's not you know, crazy heavy, but it does have an ability to distinguish between small weight change so for example, if I use this to mimic uh, for you to lift something that's one pound or 1.2 pound, you actually feel the difference between one pound and 1.2 pounds. So it's up to more than two pounds, but it have a small, very small increment of force increasing. So you can tell very fine differences. And this also have more than 4,000 resolution, but I mean 400 resolutions. So you can do very fine control with this. So one of the demonstration that they come with this is to uh, showcase texture. So there is one texture that's fine sand, and the other one is rocky stone. Okay, and you can actually tell the difference. And the other one is sandpaper, so fine sand, sandpaper, you can actually feel the difference of the grinds and everything. So it's quite amazing. And they use Squirrel to program. So Squirrel is a very sort of higher level C++ language. Right? So it's easy to program, and quite a lot of games actually use Squirrel to do their programming nowadays. So it's within the same ballpark, right? So I want to talk about this in an application outside of gaming, right? And this is what I do. So uh, if you haven't heard about what I do, I'm a teacher here. But in addition, I have a degree in electrical engineering and I'm currently doing my research in cognitive psychology at Columbia. So I'm trying to combine how we can use technology into teaching or into inspiring people. Okay, and that's sort of things I would like to do, sort of my own game creation, right? So in doing so, I want to see if this can be used in teaching physics, okay? Because as someone who came from an engineering background, as someone who see a lot of uh, my colleagues decide not to pursue engineering, and also as someone who sees some of my students um, who might not know physics concept too well, they become limited in their ability to learn further knowledge. So I want to use this to see if there is any way that we can help people learn physics, learn some of the more abstract ideas, so that students can sort of build that mental model, remember mental model, through this grounded experience, so that they will be able to see and feel and predict what physics law tells them without really knowing the law. So what I'm trying to say is, without really telling them F equal to MA, force equal to mass times acceleration, right? I want them to feel it so that they can be able to internally understand this law and using further context, right? So what I did was I did it in three different groups. So I did it with fourth and fifth graders. I did it with eighth graders. And I actually did it with some of the students that we have in our school here. Right? So what I do is I introduce some abstract physics concept. So one of them is Newton's second law, F equal to MA, right? And the other one is a more offense, but on the same sort of horizon, is the Newton's law of universal gravitation. They use the same kind of ideology, just that they have different um, entity inside of the equation, right? So Newton's second law is the easier one, and gravitation is the harder one. All right, and it's also the same way in our natural physics curriculum, where uh, people learn Newton's second law first and then learn the universal gravitation. So what I found is that, of course, this helps students learn, and that's why we are so proud of it, right? This helps students learn. Secondly, it, this helps younger students to accelerate their learning. So, so as community college students, most of us came from high school where we actually have learned physics before. So we have certain prior knowledge in this physics. However, we also have some misconceptions carried with us. So with 
younger students who never really had this learning before, they can rely this on their past experience. So a lot of times when I teach students using this joystick, I teach them using a context of catapult simulation. So I have them to play a catapult game with this and tell them the information. And they will tell me, oh, it's just like you know throwing baseball with my kid. Oh, I mean, sorry, not kids, but kid brother, right? <laughs> no, it will be very weird for fourth graders to have kids. But um, <laughs> it was like, oh, it's like throwing baseball with my kid brother or kicking soccer, right? Because they have those experiences. And as human, we actually have those experiences, right? As since the moment we are born, we are active. We are exploring the 3D space. We are receiving all kinds of force feedback. Just we haven't really connect those experiences with physics, you see. Now that we have this as a bridge, we can help them to connect what they already know from their own experience into what they are intend to learn so that they can have a better connection, enhance their mental model formation, so that they will be able to learn it better and remember it for longer, right? So this helped younger students to accelerate learning, which means that after the same period of session, even though they don't really have anything, know anything about Newton's law, right? They came out as the same level as community college students, which means it's amazing because you cover quite a lot of material for them in a short period of time, okay? And finally, we have learned that students learn the easier content with this. That is, if you learn this, uh, learn Newton's second law with it, and without using this to teach you gravitation, just by telling you the idea of gravitation, you will have this prior knowledge to rely on, so that you will be able to understand the concept better, you see. This is what we call a transfer, transfer effect. So you transfer from what you learn onto something that you're about to learn, right? One transfer effect, I can just give you an example right now, I use in my class quite a lot, right? If I tell you about electric current, right, you might be very, very caught off guard. You don't really know what it is, you don't really, see, you never really see it before, right? But if I want to tell you this, by telling you that, try to imagine how water current flows in rivers, in channels, right? Mm -hmm. Have you remember that concept? Then tell you all the characteristics of electric current, and have you map each one onto it, you will transfer one from what you know about the water current into electric current, right? And hence, help you learn electric current better. So this kind of transfer effect, effect we can also achieve by having students learn with this at an easier concept, okay? So, Next, I want to talk to, talk to you about um, how this, in the broad perspective, has been shaping the movement of using education technology, okay? Because education technology is actually a booming field. I mean, it's not as big as you know, EA Sports or anything else, but it's actually upcoming, right? And there are two main reasons for it. First reason is because this country is trying to push a STEM movement Right, STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, right? So we're trying to have our younger students submerge into this environment as early as possible so that they can build the mindsets to prepare them for higher education, that to have them into science, scientists, engineers, or anything that help sort of technology advancement, right? So this is one of the reasons education technology has been booming because it's the direct application, you see, right? And the second part is that a lot of educators now is promoting a student-centered learning method. So what I'm saying by student-centered is traditionally, you go through high school, you go through elementary school in the classroom format. I'm a teacher, I'm here, you know, spilling my heart out, telling you all the information. I'm pushing the information to you, you see. And, and you are there, and it doesn't really matter to me, at least as in some regards, how much you can, how much you learn, how much you do receive the information. It's more for me to actually put the information out there, right? And that was what we used to call a teacher-centered model. The education, curriculum, instruction is surrounded by designing how teachers teach. But now we have moved, because we have learned that people learn different ways, right? Like I learn different ways than my colleague. So I have to use different ways to teach myself in some ways, right? So we learn different ways. And we want to help students to succeed by designing curriculum around their way of learning, okay? And with education technology, it's more customizable. So we can able to, well, we're able to do that. So quite a lot of people like Pearson, right, McGraw-Hill, they are all going to this 
area by incorporating the uh, education technology in their publishing, right? Quite a lot of company is doing development, even Novan nowadays. Um, after corresponding with them and quite a lot of other um, researcher in the area is also telling them, they are investigating on how this equipment can help medical students to learn about doing uh, operation, you know, surgical operation without actually cutting open a patient, which is quite good because, you know, nobody wants to be the trial and error, <laughs> kind of, right? So, so they are doing those kind of things, right? And actually, now that we mentioned, in UK, there is actually a, a college that was a veterinary school. So they are using similar technology to mimic on how to train students to deliver a cow. So they, will, uh, they create a simulator of a cow's rear, right? And then the students actually need to stick their hand into it, into the simulator, and uh, feel what a cow that's about to be, little cow that's about to be born, feel like. So that they can actually learn how to deliver. Because on the farm, you don't have a cow delivering every day. But with this equipment, you can train the student. Sorry. So, so they are doing as well, but we are more advancing that. So, uh, so we are shifting this push to model to pull model. And there are three types of education technology okay, that's really out there. All right? One of them is to do instruction enhancing. The other one is what we call design-based teaching. Right? And finally is gamification. So I'm going to tell you about them each. So instruction enhancing is using education technology to aid information intake process. So this, for example, is uh, instruction enhancing. Right? I'm still using it in education context. I'm enhancing the way that you learn about information. I'm enhancing the way that you get information from the content, right? Given that it's through haptic instead of maybe through visual or audio or in a combination, right? So we are enhancing it. So there are some other traditional education technology, especially simulation. So the first one is Colorado Fat Lab, P-H-E-T, right? And if you liked, you can take on this website and go to their website and check out all the simulation, education simulation games that they have created. It's a freeware, so just go there and give it a try. All right? They use this sort of visual simulations, computer simulation to help students learn a lot of things about science. All right? And the other one is haptic technology. And there's another one called Ro Lego Robotic. All right? So you have probably seen people build Lego robots. Yeah. Right? So we have used Lego robots in helping younger students to learn about physics as well by building the robot and sort of by projecting yourself into the robot. Okay, imagine that robot is you so that students will be able to learn the physics by just mimicking their, uh, mimicking, mimicking their movements and have robot do it and map that information connections so that they will have a stronger reinforcement that help them to remember or help them to understand. Okay, and one last one is Microsoft Connect, right? So, play Connect before, everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So when you wave your hand, it feels, right? So we actually have a lot of researchers working on how Connect can be using education content, right? So that to actually use Connect to interact with the physical environment, I mean, a, sorry, sorry, a si simulated environment, like you would in a physical world, and see how that will help you. Those are information enhanced. It enhances the information intake, right? Then the next one is design-based learning. Actually, your class is a good example of design-based learning because you are learning how to design a 3D environment, right? So, so actually, the practice of designing, you learn about it, right? So try to build something. Try to learn the skill set of knowledge through participating in a design process, okay? So what we have is Scratch. Anybody heard Scratch before? It's a, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it's good, right? So Scratch is a, it's a very low level uh, computer programming knowledge, uh, language, actually. Um, they use a block language. So when you do computer coding, you spend a lot of time on learning the syntax, right? On learning what code to type, and then you, know, you will have error just by not having a bracket or something, right? Mm -hmm. So Scratch is trying to take away all of that. They use a block coding. Scratch is also freeware, so you can free to download it from uh, MIT's website. Right? And Scratch basically help you to learn about the logic of programming 
before knowing any of the programming language. All right? So for younger students, this is great because they don't really have to bother about uh, learning the syntax. They just need to learn the logic so they can learn the if loop, the for loop, without having the trouble to go through debugging and not really know what's going on. Right? <coughs> if they made a mistake, they probably don't know what kind of mistake they made, either with the logic or with the syntax. Now take away the syntax, all you need to focus on is logic. So a lot of young students, even entry-level computer science students, use this to learn about programming. Okay? And they use this as a community environment to design their own games. So Scratch is this weird cat-looking thing. Right? So you can design an environment to have Scratch as the main character and participate to maze game, participate to like, uh, horizontal scrollers. Right? So those are the ones that uh, people have been using as design base. Lego Robotic is another example, right? So Lego Robotic also adopts the block uh, language programming idea. So when you try to program the Lego Robotics, right, you program their motors through a block language, okay? So through the design process, students actually learn about machine and computer interface, right? They also learn about sequential logic. So quite a lot of things that you can learn from doing the design. And finally, gamification. Now, gamification is a very, very new field. It's actually so new that a lot of times when you go online and type the word gamification, you probably couldn't really find a clear definition just yet. Okay? But it is actually a very cool idea. It's trying to use game thinking and game mechanism in non-gaming context. All right? So what is a game thinking and game, gaming mechanism in some ways? Right? So when you play, for example, a game, any kind of game, not even computer games, any kind of game, right? There are score, there are ranking, there are progress, right? So all those elements are what sort of surrounds a gaming environment. And if you take those elements out, you put it into the context of non-gaming, for example, social network, right? When you build your Facebook profile, okay? It will tell you that, oh, you are 60% complete, 80% complete, right? So those are some ways using gaming ideology to help you push forward your progress, right? Or make it into a ranking table, all right? A lot of those things use what this gamification is trying to do, right? It's just that re recently, a lot of people came together and formed this more central idea of gamification. Now, gamification, one of the be be biggest thing about gamification is to increase users' motivation. Right? So in playing games, okay, all kinds of games, the most important part, right, even as a game designer, right, if you create a game that nobody's motivated to play, nobody is engaged in, chances are you're probably not gonna make it out there. Right? So increasing motivation is very, very important. And in other contexts, it's also very important, right? If you're a company who's trying to train your employee to do better, their motivation is important. If you are a teacher trying to get your student to learn as quickly, as much as you can, they better be motivated, right? Otherwise, they'll be nappy in class or, you know, talking to their girlfriend and whatnot, right? So they want to be, you want them to be motivated to learn. So this has been using a broad context. And more information you can find is in, uh, in gamification.com, uh, CO, actually now the COM one. There is a lot of good information out there. Just to throw out a few, Swarthmore, one of the uh, private elite uh, college, liberal college, use StarCraft II to help his student, their students to learn about economics, mathematics, and all the important content, right? So in StarCraft II, you have the idea of building, right? You need to build your army. That's an economic concept, guys. That's, you are learning that without really knowing that. Now they're actually trying to put things together, right? Or we have people in Stanford, okay? They use something called Betty's Brain. So AAA Lab is a, is a lab, cognitive lab in Stanford. And they are specializing in building um, sort of like an avatar, right? So this avatar, you taking this avatar as your student. It's a, it's a computer simulated avatar, right? And the cool thing is that you are trying to teach your virtual students by organizing their brain, right? So you say that, um, put an example, water circulation, right? Seawater, 
become steam, become cloud, cloud full as a rain, right? There is a lot of logic and a lot of sort of correlation in between each element, right? So by putting that map together, like a physical connection map, and use that as the mental model for your visual students, all right? Supposingly, lay the visual students who learn the information at the same time you will as well. But to make it even better, right? A lot of times students just randomly select, okay, so this is related to that, and draw a not so good map, right? So to motivate students to do even better, they have those avatars compete in a game show. So your avatar, my avatar, his avatar will all compete in a game show where the host will be throwing out all kinds of questions and see whose avatar can actually answer those questions. So now student will be thinking, huh, so my avatar is gonna represent us, represent me, right? And I'm gonna look really bad if my avatar turned out to be not so smart. So they are much motivated to put more information in, hence they learn much more in the process, right? And finally, there is another one that out in Columbia, right? A lot of people, a uh, group of researchers is trying to use Second Life. So Second Life is an open-ware environment where you can go and create your own world, right? They use this to have a collective environment to help students to submerge themselves into a phys uh, historic event, right? So sort of project yourself as an avatar in a historical event and see, as a historical figure, what would you do, right? And they rank students' response. So the student will be like, okay, I'm gonna try to make the best decision I can. And by doing that, they understand what people back in the day trying to think, or what they're trying to do. So they learn physics that way. I mean, sorry, history that way, okay? So what's in conclusion? We know that advancement in technology has been useful in helping the next generation, okay, of researcher, gamer, educator, right? And we all know that technology education in education is needed more than ever. To tell you the truth, I think it's at the peak right now, right? Because we, as a country, actually as a generation, we're trying to find the best way, right? A hundred years ago, right? Actually, a hundred years ago, here in New York, in the United States, actually, we start to have the public school system, right? We started finding a way so that we can help everybody learn, right? It was for early immigrants, right? They cannot have a private tutor. They cannot really have... Um, the, their kids to learn from a renowned scholar, right? They need a system where everybody can get education, right? And that's why we have a public school system today. Now, we are trying to reinvent that. We're trying to help every student in the public school to learn the best to their ability. And by doing that, we need to have a system that caters to their ability, right? So instead of teaching a, a teacher to teach in every single possible way, we're designing technology to aid teachers or even sometimes use technology as a main instruction, um, instructor mechanism to help students learn, right? So we are needing this more than ever. And what does this mean to you? I mean like, Doug, you've been up there talking about all this good stuff, but it doesn't really do anything to me, is it? Well, it does. Because I want you guys to think about how to, how to help yourself learn more from technology. You see, you are learning Maya, right? But Maya is not probably the only piece of 3D software environment that is you be using out there, right? There is the other ones. There is gonna be advancements. You are gonna be out there and you are gonna be have to learn that from your own. So how do you use what we learned today to help you to learn in the future context? Well, you see, grounded cognition, right? Root your learning, you root your future learning from based on your current learning, right? So if there is any confusion, try to make a connection to something that you already know, something more tangible, you see, so that you can learn much better, right? And how can you use your strengths in designing and creation to help other people to learn? Like I said, education technology is a booming market, right? So maybe out of here to go work for an uh, iPhone app company to create the next generation of um, Angry Bird. Maybe we can also use your skill set to try to see if there is any ways that we can incorporate a certain content. A certain content that maybe as a kid or as someone who goes to the public school, you don't really understand. Right? Like, you know, be honest with you guys. When I was an engineering student, I don't really understand electromagnetic. It took me a while to understand all those three-dimensional factors and how do they interact with each other. And to tell you the truth, that's one of my motivators to become an education researcher. 
to research on ways that we can help students to learn that. So in the future, engineering students or technology students or science students and whatnot doesn't have to go through what I go through. Or in, in some way, when they go through what I go through, there is a way for them to learn the technology, learn the information, and without wasting much time and parents' money, right? So there is a lot of things that you can do with what you know and from what I'm telling you, right? So try to combine your strength and try to think ahead and try to use this piece of information to help you and help others, all right? So I want to thank you for listening me, listen to me talk and be a cool bunch of students. <laughs> and my information is there. My email is wongsd at gmail.com. And please feel free to email me if there is any questions that you may have, if there is any kind of clarification I can do, or if there is, if you have a good idea, you just want to see you know, if I think so, or because, I mean, you know, let's face it, I've been working on this for a long time, so I kind of know what I'm talking about, right? So if there is a cool idea, let me know. And I will tell you if there's anything already out there, or there is maybe a good niche that for you to work on, all right? So I want to thank you again for, you know, listen me introducing some of the things that I know. And if there's any questions, please feel free to ask me. All right? All right, put your hands together.